Hi everyone, my name is Paul Dytel and I'm co-author of Intro to Python for Computer Science and Data Science, Learning to Program with AI, Big Data, and the Cloud. This particular video is geared to those of you who are college instructors and may be teaching from this book and are interested in learning about our Jupyter Notebook slides that we are providing as instructor supplements. Now when you go to the Pearson Instructor Resource Center and download the slides and extract the contents onto your system, you will have a folder that looks like the one I have here on the screen. Within that folder you'll see a readmefirst.txt file, which of course you should take a look at first. You'll also see a table of contents.ipynb file. That is the top level Jupyter Notebook uh, that gives you access to the opening notebook for each of the 17 chapters. And for every notebook we provide, we also give you a pure HTML version of that notebook in which you can simply load it up into your web browser and not have to worry about having a Jupyter Notebook server running locally on your computer. And similar to what we do with the live notebooks in the HTML files, we provide you with links to the corresponding notebooks that start each chapter and then subsequently all the additional section by section notebooks as well. Now this video assumes that you've already as we state in the before you begin section of the intro to Python book gone to the anaconda.com website and downloaded the Python in this case 3.7 version of Anaconda. Anaconda is a real nice um, Python distribution because it comes with the IPython interpreter uh, for interactive Python development which is uh, the preferred one nowadays. It comes with Python 3.7 at this point which is the current version of Python. By the way Python 2.7 is going away its end of life as of next year. Of course it'll probably keep um, going on and on for quite a while after that but going forward you really should be using Python 3 and higher and specifically Python 3.7 now. Our book was written to Python 3.6 and higher. Now uh, this is available for Windows, Mac OS and Linux so uh, you'll download whichever installer is appropriate for your particular system execute the installer and then follow the on-screen prompts and along the way you may be given the option uh, depending on your platform of installing some additional software as well so for instance the latest installer gives people the option of also installing the JetBrains IDE called PyCharm which is a popular Python IDE so under the assumption that you've already installed that software from the folder that contains all of our Jupyter Notebooks for uh, presentation purposes, all you need to do is execute the command Jupyter space lab and notice Jupyter is spelled with a Y. This stands for Julia, Python, and R, three languages that are the um, core languages supported by Jupyter, but actually you can use it with pretty much any programming language nowadays if you install the appropriate kernels. Now once you execute this command it should go ahead and open up the root folder from which you launched Jupyter in the Jupyter Lab environment. If for some reason this does not appear on your screen, going back out to the command line, you'll see that it gives you a URL that you can copy and paste into your preferred web browser. Uh, by default, it should open the root folder from which you launched Jupyter um, in your uh, default web browser on your computer. So. Uh, I'll go back over here to Jupyter. Now by default you also should see on the left side here the files tab open. Um, on Chrome at the moment there's a bug that's preventing the icon for this next tab from displaying so you may see something there depending on what browser you're looking at. And over here on the right side you'll see the launcher which probably won't have all the same options that I do because I've also gone ahead and installed support for programming in C and Java at this point as well. So from the launcher if you were working from scratch you could create a new Python 3 Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you also if you scroll way down here have access to a terminal window and by the way all of the options here are also available through the new options um, uh, in the 
uh, file menu or by just opening a launcher window uh, to get to these buttons that you see on the right hand side. Now our starting point for this piece of presentation is going to be to open up the table of contents .ipymb notebook. Uh, this is going to give me the ability to just introduce a few things about the book to you. First of all here is the book cover and if you have any questions at all as you're working with the book or trying to learn about how to use Jupyter Notebooks, please just go ahead and contact me at my email address. And please make sure to spell it correctly so it doesn't wind up in the inbox of a nice gentleman in Germany who's been getting my email for the last 30 years. Uh, once you have this notebook up and running, these are all live links to our social media channels, so you can also follow us on those channels as well. Now we have the print book, but we also have ebook versions that students can rent or purchase at lower cost from vitalsource.com and redshelf.com. And I've also recorded extensive video notes uh, specifically for the core Python chapters 1 through 10. So uh, depending on which version of the book students get, they may get a uh, scratch card inside the front cover of a print book. Uh, they may get a unique access code from some of those online vendors that sell the ebook versions. But the companion website, which is password protected and needs to have a unique registration code, is where they would use use those codes to access the videos. Uh, the videos are also available to Safari Online Learning subscribers uh, in my Python Fundamentals Live Lessons, and they can be purchased from informit.com. However, I will point out that parts one through three of, those, of that product correspond to the same video notes that are in uh, chapters one through ten. So uh, there is a little bit more in the version in the Python Fundamentals Live Lessons, but not enough to make it worthwhile to also purchase parts one through three. So just uh, let your students know about that. Again, we're using the Anaconda Python distribution, and in this notebook, we also provide links to the opening notebook for each of the subsequent chapters. Now, you can either click on these to open the notebooks, or you can go directly to whichever uh, chapter you're presenting, and I'll do this for chapter two for demonstration purposes here today. And when you're in chapter two, you'll see a bunch of notebook files numbered by their sections. For the most part throughout the book, we use one notebook per section, and the reason we chose to do that is because in the book, as we were writing it, we were always starting over uh, from snippet number zero in the vast majority of sections, and we want the notebook snippet numbers to match up with the presentation in the uh, print books and the ebooks. So let's go ahead and open the starting notebook for chapter two. The starting one will always have double zero in its name to um, indicate the objectives. By the way, when you click a tab, it toggles this left-hand pane open and close, just so you can make some more room on your screen if you're interested. The opening notebook will have the objectives for the chapter, as well as the outline for the chapter with links to all of the chapter's other notebooks. You can open them from here by clicking the corresponding link, or you can go back to the Files tab to open them from there as well. Now the typical notebook is going to consist of headings for the section. Throughout the section, all the headings will be included that will help you and your students follow along with the original book presentation. You'll have live code snippets in executable code boxes, which we'll talk about again in, a, in just a moment, and you'll have some number of text bullets as well to help drive your presentation. And you can customize these notebooks, which is another thing that I want to talk about here. So when you see a code cell like this, there's a couple of different ways to execute it. You can click out here in the left-hand margin to select it. By the way, notice the cursor. You can drag these things around and reorder them if you wanted to, so you can change my presentation however you like. Uh, but once the code cell is selected, either by clicking out here or by clicking inside the cell itself, you can hold the control key on your computer and press either the enter or return key, depending on your keyboard, to execute that cell and immediately see its results. And this is one of the reasons why Python, I think, is so much easier to learn for a lot of students. They can see via these interactive code cells exactly what's happening. If there's a problem, they'll see the problem get displayed immediately, and then they can go back, 
fix the problem, execute the cell again, and move on in their learning experience. And this is true both in Jupyter and also at the command line in the IPython interpreter, which, by the way, Jupyter is using to execute the code in these code boxes. Now, let's just say you wanted to add some additional bullets about this uh, particular code cell. These notebooks are editable, so you can add your own new cells very easily uh, with shortcut keys or via commands on the toolbar also. So for instance, if I want to put a new cell above this cell where I can put in a note, all I have to do is click out here in the margin, type the letter A, and it inserts a new code cell by default. But if I also type the letter M for markdown, it will change this into a markdown cell, which by the way, you can also control from this drop down up at the top. So I could go ahead and say, you know, this is a new bullet, and in markdown, uh, I can do bold by using double asterisks around the item that I want in bold. And if I want to then render that, I just type control enter, and now I can see my rendered text. And you can do the same thing by adding a cell below with the letter B. So A for above, B for below. And again, if you want to convert to markdown, just type the letter M or select it from the drop down up above. So uh, asterisk for a bullet, this is another bullet and control enter to render that. So really easy to uh, work your own thoughts into these notebooks if you would like to update the presentation for your own purposes. And you can add new code as well. Uh, that's another nice feature. As you saw when I added the new cells, they were code cells by default. Uh, if by any chance there's a run of cells that you want to execute all at once, you can click the first one in the margin click the next one or the last one in the margin so highlight a whole range and when I type control enter it will execute both of these assignments and assignments by the way don't have output associated with them so notice nothing showed up underneath each of these cells however when I go add together X and Y that does have a value which then gets displayed right below the cell so real easy to show what or to talk about what each of these things does and then immediately show what they do and uh, by not displaying the outputs initially as we give these notebooks to you it enables enables you to kind of drive the discussion and let students try to figure out what's going to happen and then you can actually show them what's going to happen as well. Now we do have um, non-text based outputs, we have visualizations extensively throughout the book. So I do want to also just show you uh, two visualizations quickly here. Uh, first of all, you'll notice up here we've got a home uh, icon and the folder that we're currently in. So if you want to go back to the root folder from which you launched, just click that home icon. And let's go into chapter five for a moment. And the last of the notebooks is what I would like to take a look at first. Uh, this particular notebook is for a section that introduces some data science stuff. Uh, simulation and visualizations and in particular we focus on the law of large numbers by rolling a six-sided die some number of times so that we can plot a bar plot showing how frequently each face came up so when we do 600 times we don't get uh, very close in accurate in um, totals for faces one through six and if I scroll down if we do 60,000 times now they're a lot closer and if we eventually go to six million times now they're almost exactly a million each uh, for the number of times each face came up so you can experiment this by running the code in this notebook multiple times you can also do it from the command line interactively with the IPython command and telling it to enable what's known as matplotlib support. Now if you want to run this inline in your notebook there's something called a magic, the percent matplotlib magic in this case, saying that we want matplotlib uh, visualizations to display to be displayed right here in line in the notebook so if I go ahead and execute all of the code for this particular example so I'll just execute them all at once. It will run through the code. As it executes each cell, it will update the snippet number. And for this cell, it will show you the final visualization right below the cell. And in this case, I rolled the die 600 times. But I can go back up here very quickly, and I can change the number of times that I rolled the dice from 600 to whatever number I want. 
then I could re-execute everything from here down and see the updated results down below. And in fact, in this notebook, I uh, have some demonstrations of how to recall prior uh, commands as well so that you can execute them again in new cells if you would like. So that's a static visualization, but we also have a whole bunch of dynamic visualizations as well. Let me just close these down. So uh, I just want to show you, whoops, I just want to show you in the file menu here that I can say new terminal and for the dynamic visualizations we don't display them in the Jupyter Notebooks because it requires a bunch of additional setup uh, and installations of software uh, and plus they run slower in the notebooks as well so when you launch a terminal in Jupyter this gives you access to a Linux based command line directly in the Jupyter environment it automatically opens in whatever root folder you launch Jupyter from and for this one I'm going to change into the chapter 6 folder and when you're in that folder you'll see that there is a script called roll die dynamic which we talk about in that chapter and if I launch that from my command line here uh, with the name of the script the number of animation frames I would like to execute and the number of dice that I'd like to roll per animation frame it will execute the script and in a moment a window will pop up showing you the live uh, animation. So this is part of our law of large numbers discussion where over time the student is able to see how the bars start to even out as we roll more and more dice along the way. So uh, as you can see Jupiter is a really nice environment for presenting the content to your students. Once you're done presenting that content, you can close down your tabs. I will point out, by the way, that uh, unfortunately this icon is not displaying, but if you click here, it will show you all of the notebooks that have that still have what they call kernels running and any terminal windows that you had launched previously. If you click the names of these, it will reopen those items over here in the editing and execution area. If you click shutdown on these, it will terminate their processes in the background. Not sure why that popped back up there so quickly, but it'll terminate their processes. And I've found that in general, uh, on my system at least, I don't want to have more than, say, 10 or so kernel sessions running at a given time. Otherwise, I start to run into some issues with Jupyter. Uh, so in that case, what I tend to do is go back out to my command line and terminate the Jupyter server which you can do by typing control C and you see it says do you want to shut down you can either type yes or type control C again if you don't respond it's going to resume the server so if I type control C twice it'll terminate the server and then I can launch it again from scratch with the Jupyter lab command if I need to so actually let me go ahead and do that just so I can bring up my contact information once again so just as a reminder if you do have any questions on what I've shown you here today uh, over here in that table of contents notebook there's my contact info please go ahead and send me an email and if you like the book and working from it please recommend the book to your colleagues as